Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call in a call to order and welcome you to the Hampton Wilbraham Regional School District School Committee meeting. It is 6.30 p.m. I see that David Sanders from Wilbraham Public Access Channel is recording. Is there anyone else here recording this meeting? We will do roll call in alphabetical order. Bill Bonzetti? Cheryl Caruana? Here. Sean Kennedy? Here. Patrick Kiernan? Present. Lisa Murray? Here. Maura Ryan? Here. Michelle Boudreau? Aye. Here. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We do have a meeting for executive session. Pursuant to Master and Law, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, 3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of a, a public body and the chair so declares, Lauren Bryan. Uh, make a motion to go to executive session. Second. So, I thought of this afterwards. I don't think we can because it's not listed, it's not on the post. So, even though we set it, something doesn't have the ability. So you're saying it's listed here, but it's not listed in the posting? So you have to, no, it's in the post, you have to list either the person's name, if it's an individual, or the, the, organization. the negotiation unit, right. unit. Right. Yeah. Okay. so it's not there, so if it's not the listing, I would just encourage us to push to the next one. I make a motion to table the motion. Okay. Second. Yep. We vote on tabling it, and then we don't. Have to do it. Yeah, but I don't know that that's tabling the same thing, though, because the idea is you can't. It's if you table it, it becomes dead at the end of the meeting, unless we say we're tabling it until the next meeting. So we can vote. Okay. Yep. Uh, all in favor? Uh, aye. Roll call. Roll call. Um, Cheryl. Aye. Sean. Aye. Lisa. Aye. Patrick. Lisa. Aye. Four. Uh, myself, hi. Okay, so we will continue on with the student re um, representative report. Molly? There we go. Hello. Um, so, student council is having a stress for a cause day for the ALS Association tomorrow. Um, so, they'll be taking donations at the door and they're very persistent about it. Um, the chorus and band programs will be having their honors recital next Wednesday, the 8th, from, uh, starting at 7 p.m. And the swim and dive team is league champions, and so is the wrestling team. So congrats to them. Um, Tuesday the 7th, there's another mini, uh, mini jog for the third graders. And semester two open house is happening next Thursday. And that's all that I have. There's also, I think, a dine out tonight at Mandarin. Oh, was that? I thought it was like canceled. They might have postponed it, but oh. it was canceled. So. I'll let you get that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Have a great week. Thank you. Stay warm tomorrow. Where are you going to go? All right, so we will continue with the Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations and Human Resources, Aaron. All righty. Um, so you have a few memos in your file. Uh, the first relates to the second floor railing. Um, this has been a, an ongoing safety concern for the school and the district. Uh, we have a proposal, sorry about that. Uh, we have a proposal um, to uh, put uh, this work out to bid, um, and we expect the total cost all in to um, be less than $120,000. Um, we're suggesting that we consider taking that from the um, Minichaw Capital State Stabilization Account. Um, we do think it's going to be significantly less than 120000 but looking at where bids have gone recently, um, we're just apprehensive about where things might come in at. Um, if somehow we get a bid above that, we bring it back to, to have you look at it. And this cost includes um, engineering fees and things like that. How much money is in the stabilization fund now? Say again? How much money is in the fund now? 
Uh, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of three hundred and some thousand dollars, two twenty-five. <clears throat> So when, I think it was December, this was raised, there was a potential to inquire with the town about ARPA. So this mm -hmm. would clearly fit under a use for ARPA. Has that conversation happened with either town? Uh, so we've, we've done the switches. Um, we're funding the $300,000 of switches from the town's ARPA funds. Um, we haven't, this, this, is, this is bent on our, our capital plan um, as something to do, so we didn't necessarily Think to take it for ARPA funds. Um, last I talked to the town, they have dried up their ARPA funds, I believe. Both yeah. towns still have ARPA funds available. Hmm? Both, Both towns. towns have ARPA funds. I can. But during, I apologize, during one of our finance and operations subcommittee meetings, it was n noted <coughs> by one of the members from Wilbraham that was attending that they didn't necessarily have the funds were earmarked for other things. They may have been earmarked, but the funds don't exist. They haven't been. Correct, because I know that Hamden still has funds available. I think Hamden has like 600000 and I think we'll ram it somewhere in the bulk of the 400000 So my recommendation on this would be to reach out to the towns. This would be a clear, they have a great use of ARPA, and potentially look at it and see if we can split it between the towns and, and the district versus going all in from a stabilization fund. I think we could argue whether that's what this is really truly intended for the stabilization fund was created and if we need to by a third, that's that's pretty rich for a for a for an account and frankly I'm happy, happy to take it all back to the towns and, and make that request if that's the will of the school committee. And we should put it on the agenda in the future to talk about the stabilization fund and exactly what it means and what we should use it for. I think we should just get some clarity on that because I think all of us would have a different opinion on around the table. I think it's come off three different times in yeah. And even came up during one of the budget rounds a couple years ago. So you're right, so. Does that suggestion work? Was that the decision of the committee? Yes. Does anyone? I'm just trying to. Yeah, well, if you could go back to the towns, I think that's a. And just. Uh, did you go to them and they said we don't have any, or did you just hear No, that? In, in meetings we've had, they have indicated that, that, that Wilbraham has indicated that their funding has been earmarked already, so that that, that would not be an available source. Instead of just assuming that we'll take it back, can I just, can we call it a majority vote that we will have Aaron do that? <coughs> So then it's, it's noted somewhere that we as a full committee decided to do that. I don't think it needs a vote. I think we can just say as a committee. Right? No, I don't think, I, mean, I know, but I think it's better to just do an all those in favor yeah. situation, not a full call or anything. Motion have Aaron approach both communities to discuss using the ARPA funds to support this with the district potentially kicking in portion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any other votes? Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next item on the list um, relates to our METCO grant. Um, as I've shared, our numbers are when they have dwindled rapidly in our METCO program. Um, next year, if we do not um, recommit to METCO, um, we will have no students and therefore no funding. Um, so that is 130,000 um, that would typically go to offset our budget. Um, at this time, with no other source for those funds, um, it's our recommendation uh, that the school committee uh, vote to recommit to the state metro program on a going forward basis. So the 130000 then we also receive $8,314 per student. So yes, we are in, <clears throat> so we're in an interesting situation. We're in a hold harmless situation with METCO. So they, that, that grant um, has a, I don't think it's a law, it's just a provision that they, they, they try to make sure that there isn't an interruption in funding. If you're committing to this program and you have a drop off in students for a year or a couple years because you just couldn't enroll enough, you didn't have enough room, they don't want you to lose funding. So we're not really living within the spirit of it. The spirit of it is that you would continue it at times when you could. Um, but we fell through the cracks um, to, to keep it simple. So 
we we we're at we were at one point at that hundred and thirty thousand dollar level and we're not going to go below it as long as we continue to commit to the program. Um, what if we were to take in additional students and we were to um, I think end up with that would come to you know what's called fifteen ish students. If we were to exceed that funding level, our MECO grant would go up above 130,000. But for now, um, in speaking with the, the program director, um, as long as we make a, a conscious effort to continue the program, um, they would honor our funding level in their minds. Do we have the infrastructure in place? So I know I went to a high school that had MECO, and there was a MECO coordinator who was part of the schools, does that exist here? Do we have the right personnel in place to support um, to, there, There's not been anyone in place to this point. I mean, I kind of fell into this when I when I started looking at our, our grants. Um, it was Pete Dufresne at one point, because he was at the meeting and that's what he told us. Right. When he was at the middle school. I mean, I think, I think some districts do have a, a METCO coordinator. Um, we We've been using it to offset some, some instructional costs and some transportation costs. So the part of part of the MET program is that we provide transportation to those students. So that would just be my question. Do we have a plan to truly implement and support MECO <coughs> students? And if so, great. But I think that's really important to have if we're in the <laughs> All I can say is we have, we have the, the same plan as, as we had two and a half years ago when I got here. Um, I think we have to, we're, there's a convening meeting on March 8th, which is where we will have to have determine that we are going to uh, recommit to the program. Um, at that point, I can have conversations with them about what the requirements are and, and whether we can, you know, what we need to do. I don't believe we're required to have like an entirely separate full-time position as a coordinator. There just isn't the, the funding for that. So to some degree, you know, we'll do what we do and we'll, we'll coordinate the grant to the best of our ability as we're doing now. Is there an LPVEC MECO coordinator? Hmm? Is there an LPVEC MECO coordinator? Not to my knowledge, no. We're, uh, not all of the, the LPVEC schools are, are in MECO and I, I, there's no, none that I'm aware of at LPVEC. Yeah. John, what are your thoughts on this? As we're looking at trying to close budget gaps, I think every $130,000 counts. Um, I think that to the, the question of infrastructure, as we learned at the budget meeting the other day, this was sort of a part of Pete's position. Um, I think likely it would be a duty that is assigned to another administrator as an additional duty within the district. Um, I also think that uh, there are benefits to all of the students of having a more diverse student body. And so I think for all those reasons, um, I would be in favor of continuing the program. So would you need a motion? Well, it's not listed as a vote on this agenda. So I, I think tonight was just to get a sense of the committee, but you know, we can put it on the agenda for a vote. Is it possible then if that's the case, then you can come back to us at the committee and just kind of give us an idea of how you plan to create an infrastructure or have an idea of how you want Sure. facilitate the program just to make sure that we're not setting you guys up to fail if we say yes go for this sure absolutely i just think it's fair if you guys understand what you're getting yourself into and what that mm -hmm. may look like sure. uh the next item on uh, my agenda is item c uh mrhs lighting <coughs> Um, I'm not going to read the, the entire Sorry. memo, but um, this is a bit of a, a summary of uh, what has happened, um, a little bit of a cost summary uh, as we're sharing um, based on a lot of the changes that have occurred to our systems at the high school over the past couple of years. We think the best uh, sort of way of doing this would be to, to do more of a post analysis. So the the March 2022 to March 2023 analysis would probably be the best way to look at this. Um, some of the items that have changed since um, in the past couple of years during COVID 
um, include the addition of a thousand Chromebooks um, in this building. So, you know, they're charging every night, so they're being used every day and every night. Um, we've increased the air circulation. Uh, we've increased the grade of the filters that that air is being pushed through. Um, all of that um, taps our electrical system. Additionally, you know, over those years, um, as I see it, the, the, the last sort of best um, time to look at it when we were sort of in full session would be 2019. There's been significant inflation in energy prices in general in that time. So it's hard to really evaluate this. Um, we also have solar credits. So our solar credits actually track um, with our total usage. So the more we use, actually, the more solar credits we receive. So that offsetting solar credit amount is, is an impact as well. So when you combine all of those things, it's very hard to get a really good track on what the additional cost of the electric is. The kilowatt hours, um, you, you, for the solar credits, the solar credits don't subtract from the kilowatt hours, it yeah. subtracts at the end, right? No, but many of those items that I shared added yeah. to the kilowatt hours. Right. So the, uh, you know, running the air circulation um, through higher grade filters and more more frequently mm -hmm. um, is in no, mindful and electricity use, as is are the Chromebooks, as are air purifiers that are sitting in many classrooms now. So when this is done, we can just do comparison and, and we should have an accurate. Sure. Okay. Are you able to calculate the kilowatt hour for the mm -hmm. light itself? So each light based off of the structure of the building mm -hmm. has a kilowatt hour for the, the light. So we should be able to tell based off of the structure of the lights that are actually still on 24 hours a day to figure out what that cost is and then subtract it from what that March number is. So I just don't know what the light so is. Pull the calculate. kilowatt hours from the lights. So you calculate the kilowatt, yes, because it's per the hour. It, I mean, it's per the type of is, wattage on the light. If, if there's someone who can help us figure that out, I'd be I'll be more than help. happy to send you the calculation because I was just told how to calculate it the other day. Hmm? I'll be more than happy to send you the formula to calculate okay. it. I just sure. don't know, based off of the schematic of the light, the lights that are part of that system, Right. It should be like on the light, on that plane. Okay. Um, sure. Uh, we'll we'll see what we can do. I, I that's not my area of expertise. No, and I understand that. So I'm not I'm not putting you on the spot for that. I just want to help you get that number. Okay. Okay. Uh, send me the formula. Mm -hmm. so, um, I haven't heard this uh, thoroughly yet, but I'm looking at um, the uh, at this time the vendor no longer supports. The installed core product or software, and they offer no software that is backwards compatible with the underlying system. Mm -hmm. Are we going to be able to really get this fixed? Meaning, so. Sorry, let me get to this section. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, one of the problems with any proprietary system is, I mean, they control the revisions of the software. I, I don't think we can promise that their next generation would be fully backwards compatible. It's just like any um, computer. I mean, at some point, I know Apple for many years was very back, backward compatible, and, and they ended that at some point. So anytime you bought a new computer, it wouldn't be backward compatible, or your software wouldn't be backward compatible with your Mac 2C from you know the 1980s. Um, I don't necessarily know that this would be eternally backward compatible and there would be a need to um, you know make a change to things like the server and things like that should should something change or one of the things I'd add to that is we've been assured that there will be some kind of a manual override so if we get into this situation again we can send someone down to a server somewhere to put the switch to turn off the lights budget report. Um, the, the same items that we've been talking about a lot um, continue to plague us. Um, substitutes um, continue to um, 
run up a lot for us. I think I shared with you that we are running um, the past couple of years, last year and this year, we're running at least 50% over um, our sort of pre-COVID numbers on uh, total substitute days. So I think I shared we were at around 3,100 uh, days on average pre-COVID. Uh, in 2022, we were over 5,500. Um, I haven't calculated since early January, but we were at 2,800 in early January. So, you know, expect substitutes to continue to be a point of pain. Um, out of district special education costs are, are exactly where they've been. Um, you know, nothing, everything, everything in there is, is going up as opposed to going down, if anything, at this point. So um, we're trying to stay as steady as we can with that. Uh, you will see at the bottom, I have a running tally of um, the available funds we have in uh, school choice as well as ESSER that we will um, put forward towards our budget, showing that we do have, still have a pretty strong net budget available of $1.3 million. Um, looking at this, we have, um, looking at last month to this month and, and, and looking at some history, um, you know, holding steady, we have about a $200,000, $250,000 a month burn rate um, of available funds. So things we spend on things that aren't already encumbered, right? So supplies, additional things like that. Um, you know, we are kind of, uh, we've spoken with um, department heads and principals um, and not necessarily said, hey, let's freeze spending but let's be careful about what we spend. Um, I guess the, the word John used was chill spending um, to the best of our ability um, as we kind of come through this, um, knowing particularly that next year is going to be a very challenging. Any questions? change of policy or is this something no, that No, it's it's um, open meeting laws and national law. So um, a timely manner is if we had that event. run by an attorney or something just to make sure that that we're all it's national law. So we're all we're all expected to actually take the open meeting law training yeah. over two years. So it's actually part of that. So just because just because we haven't been doing it, it doesn't mean that it's not been a requirement. No, I'm just saying I, I just want to make sure that it that is a requirement because it's been a long time and we haven't done it. So exactly. So in reviewing some of what what we're doing versus the should be doing but doing, sure. we we're uncovering that there's a lot of things that haven't been happening that should be happening, and that's like that one's regulated by the state. That's not right. school committee. That's not MASC. The MASC directs you back to the open meeting law itself. But how would the did the full committee approve minutes for when they weren't necessarily at those minutes? It's not a matter of it's not a matter of being at the meeting. It's making it part of the record. Right. So because that subcommittee is doing work on behalf of the full committee, 
It's just voting them into record. Oh, okay. Similar to when we have a committee meeting, mm -hmm. um, you could maybe miss the meeting, the last meeting, but you can participate and vote because it's just making it part of the record. The abstaining from it doesn't necessarily do anything other than just saying that you don't vote on it at all. Mm -hmm. It's just saying when, when you say I and say you agree, you're just saying you are agreeing to make it part of the record. Okay. I just said, I thought you said that we had to vote on the minutes. Right? Well, they vote to make it record. So when right. to, to the vote is to vote it to record. But then it also brings forth the information that occurred at that meeting, and then, then the full committee can direct the subcommittee to look further, you know, at whatever issues were brought up. So just so just for context, the open meeting lobby requires public bodies to create and approve minutes in a timely manner. A timely manner manner is considered to be within the next three public body meetings or 30 days from the date of the meeting, which are the of a public body can show good cause for further delay. The attorney general approves minutes to be approved at the public body's next meeting whenever possible. Encourages it says. Yes. Can you read that last line? So it encourages. The attorney general yeah. encourages minutes to be approved at a public body's next meeting whenever possible. But the timing manner that was referenced right before mm -hmm. that was yeah. saying that you have either 30 days mm -hmm. or or within the next three public body meetings, whichever is later. Okay, but they're saying try to do things yeah. as quickly yeah. as possible. Um, and then the law requires that existing minutes be made available to the public with the changes of a request, whether they have been approved or remain in draft form. Um, materials or other exhibits used, to the, um, used by the public body in an open meeting must also be made available to the public with the changes of a request. Um, so back to the other, some of the other um, so the meeting minutes. Um, so yeah, so just the subcommittees have no power except to deliberate on items that have been put forth from the full committee. Um, and then no, no decisions are made until the full board says so. Uh, number two. That's the only other one that I don't think we've ever followed that. Yeah, so that's what I was going to say. So either we should, if the full committee agrees, send BE back to the policy subcommittee to memorialize how we've operated from a two standpoint, or we should Probably yeah, I think in practice we, we've been doing something different, and I think rather than going back to a policy that we haven't followed, I don't feel that they followed it before I came on board. It's, it's been that way since I got here. I yeah. would just send it back to the policy stuff to, yeah. to look at number two. To edit it to how we, have, how we do it now. Well, I mean, is that what we want to be doing? Yeah, because that's how we've been. Well, that's, that's all the best way to have. But I think doing it, doing it one way versus you know, because we've done it that way, is that the proper way that we should do it, or should we as a committee, if we're gonna to vote to have a chair to our full committee, allow them to appoint who the, the chair of the subcommittee is? Yeah, and I, I think that be, that's too much me, power. Oh. It, al it, al it allows for the committee to go into a meeting with a chair ready to go versus a meeting where you have to set an organization. Most school committees operate where the chair of the subcommittee is appointed at the, um, the organization meeting, where you vote for your new school committee chair, the officers, and then it's done at that point. I, I like how we do it now. I, I, I think that we, as a group, have all decided, yeah, okay, you can do this, this, or whatever, is anyone, but we, we've all come to an agreement in, in all the years that I've been on the committee, there's never been an issue with that. Um, so I would say let's keep doing it the way we're doing it, where the whole committee's involved rather than the chairperson dictate. I don't necessarily know that the chair dictates versus the full committee can make recommendations for the chair to make the appointment. I don't think it says that, here that the chairperson will appoint the subcommittee chairperson and its members. But I'm sure that that would be done with a discussion. I mean, again, we are, this was the, the, the reference to the policy was created as guidance, so we can create it and make it what we want it to be as a full committee. So if, we, if the will of the full committee is to bring it back to come up with either using it the way it was, the way we've done it, or following it the way that it was suggested by the MASC when the law, when the policy was adopted. Unfortunately, I don't know when it was adopted because we don't put those notes on the bottom of the policy, so we know when it was accepted into our policy manual. So two things, it also does state subject to approval by the committee. That also makes it sort of a piece by piece. But if 
we want as a committee to say that we want it to go back to the policy committee, we can certainly do that. Yeah, I would say I would make a motion to send the uh, BDE subcommittees on the school committee, uh, I guess we're going to call it subsection two, back to the policy subcommittee to have it reflect more how we've been doing things rather than how it's uh, written down. Sorry. Uh, I, I think it's one of the best meetings we have is when we all sit there and everyone everyone gets their say, everyone jumps on different committees, whatever. It's something that has always worked. I've always been proud of that. But I think that's what's in that, the writing that was subject to the approval by the committee. Yeah, I, I think, I, I don't see the difference. I don't see why we can't have a robust discussion and still have it on subject to the approval by the committee. It's no different than if we had a conversation and said, okay, Bill, Sean, and Mar are going to be on finance. Which one of you would like to be the chair? Bill can say he wants to be the chair, if nobody else wants to be the chair, and everybody agrees with that, then it's the, the, the school committee chair will appoint him as the chair. So there's no need for an organization meeting. We just start that meeting. What, what if we get someone uh, who's, uh, who is just like, um, let, let's just say uh, one party over another party and decides to make all the chairs of all the, uh, you know, just one partisan person that happens to be chair. I'm just saying. But it doesn't work, but it doesn't work like that. It can't based off the subject to approval by the committee. It's worded in such a way so it cannot be done. So if you look at the top, the school committee shall appoint. So we have been doing it this way. Is that what we're saying? No, we're not following our own policy. No, the, the only thing, I mean, it's, it's somewhat nuanced, but the difference is it gets voted on. So I think to Maura's point, if you do it during the reorganization meeting, subject to approval by the committee, the full committee has it so you roll right into your committee meeting, subcommittee meeting set up with your chair and so forth versus doing having the first meeting be a reorganization meeting and every subcommittee effectively. So the only difference is is that at that meeting we would say, all right, who, who who's gonna be chair and decide yep. if there's a full committee? Yep. So if you want to nominate yourself to be the chair of something, we could all say yes unless someone wanted to not unless someone else wanted to do it and then maybe you could explain why and then the committee could then say, okay, well we'll make a decision as a committee to say who would be the best person for that role. I mean I don't think it's gonna honestly be an issue, it's just making sure that we comply with our policy. I, 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 I'm a fan of changing rules to reflect how society is run rather than changing society based on how the rules are written. So I would say, you know, let's just go and make it how we've been doing it. If anyone had, does any, did anyone have a problem with that? We've been doing it? Is this It just makes it easier to be able to know how you get a meeting going and started because when you go into your first meeting, it's okay, so who creates that agenda for that first meeting? Because you don't have someone appointed as a chair, so you're not following how that works. That, that puts but more John, onus on John, but he at the subcommittee level shouldn't necessarily have to do that. Reorganization would be no different where you just write the agenda and the first item on the agenda is election of officers. But one thing that I see is, is that if you go from here, then you're basically, the first decision that the subcommittee has, which is to uh, elect its leadership, you're basically taking that responsibility away from the subcommittee. So basically, you're taking the autonomy of the subcommittee. Oh, can you use your microphone? Yeah, turn your Sorry. microphone on. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'll repeat that. So the way that I see it is, is that if you the, the reorganization at the full committee level is done very simply, and that is that the uh, the superintendent basically takes control of the meeting and gathers in, and basically all you do is you just say, okay, fine. First order of business is we you know elect officers. It doesn't it doesn't take a long time to do it. But like I said. What you're doing is you're taking the subcommittee and you're basically taking the power away from the subcommittee because you have a group of three members who will be working together and then you have four other members of the committee that may influence who that person is that's going to be leading the committee. But in the minds of the committee members, that may not be the person who they think is the best person to lead the committee. So I, I think that it's a, you know, it's a slippery slope because what you're doing is you're basically taking the, the first authority of the subcommittee and you're basically taking it away. So I, I but, but it's not an authority to the subcommittee. The subcommittee is just a working group 
the authority of the subcommittee from the full it, committee. The authority of the subcommittee comes in the ability to elect a chair, to elect officers to the subcommittee, correct? Right? That's like, how we do it on the full committee level. So why but that's the full that? committee, but a subcommittee is just meant to take a, a, a task from the full committee so that more time can be dedicated to the business side of what we do so that I someone am, focuses yeah. on that one aspect that's I not am. meant to have authority. There's no authority at the subcommittee level. No, Everything I, I, gets done through the full committee. No, I understand, but what you're doing is then you're taking four members who are not involved in the subcommittee and basically putting them in the, in the position of dictating who's going to lead the subcommittee, who at the subcommittee level, the members of the subcommittee may not agree. You understand what I'm saying? I, I mean, hear you, what you're saying, but I'm just saying I think it's the will of the full committee as to who they want to be. I think you're, I think you're assuming something that may not happen. Uh, I think it could have easily have been appointed similar to how our subcommittees are set up now at our organization meeting, where we just say which committee we want to be on, and then if someone would like to be the chair, then all Michelle is doing is making it to record that Bill Von Tepping has been appointed the chair of the Finance and Operations and Technology Subcommittee. I don't think it's going to be what you think it is. I just think it allows for more fluid business flow well, per our own policy. I think if you look at number two, it sort of states right out the committee chairperson is subject to approval by the committee. So it's I understand. Not, excuse yeah. me. It's not going back to the committee and, and it's been already predetermined. It's subject to the approval of the committee. Everyone subject to our approval. I understand what I understand what the policy says. What I'm saying is, is that if you and I'm for let's say policy. Right. You have three members that are appointed to policy. Four members of the committee who are not involved in policy will look at that and say, okay, well, we're going to elect this person as the chair because you're going to take the recommendations of the full committee. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the four members of the committee who are not on the subcommittee have now have a strong influence on the leadership of said committee. And when you get at the subcommittee level, the three members of the subcommittee may not agree that that person is the best person to be at the helm of that subcommittee. So <clears throat> what you're doing is, is, you're, you, is you're diluting what the subcommittee can do simply by saying, okay, you guys don't have the ability to elect who you think is going to be the most effective person to run the subcommittee. We're going to appoint that person for you. And so the ability of the subcommittee to work as efficiently as it needs to is being undermined by the ability of them to, to elect who they think. I mean, if I'm on a sports team, all right, <clears throat> I want to elect who's captain on the sports team. But don't most coaches elect, don't most coaches appoint a captain? No. There, there are some teams where that's, no. <laughs> I'm just saying that that's, and sometimes it goes based on seniority too. I think another way to look at this entire thing is that we nominate people to be chair of a subcommittee or school committee. So if I nominate somebody and they're not interested or they don't feel that they're well suited or capable or have the time, then they will decline the nomination. Um, so I think there's also that piece. And it's not just somebody arbitrarily say, okay, Bill, I want you to be the chair and that's who's going to be. I, I just like to. Just, 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 just to understand this better, so we've been doing it a certain way and it's been working for a certain way for at least eight years that we know of with the experienced members on this committee. Um, can you tell us why you think this is better? Well, first of all, that just tells us that for eight years we've had a policy that we don't follow. So there are likely a lot more policies that we have in our policy manual that we're not following. And so oh, yeah. it's, it's our diligence to make sure that we're following our own policy. Well, we're supposed to have a student representative sitting with us with voting rights and stuff like that to participate in these meetings. And we have some, sometimes, you know, we, we encourage them to stay, but they usually come and just tell us and leave. They're supposed to be elected. Yep. And I bring it up every year. And it's just we something can't that force, wants to, we can't to force a person. Huh? We can't force a person to do that role. And it's actually the, the student committee, there's five students that get elected to those roles, and it's usually one of those members. We can't force that any one of those students to come and be a part of our meeting. No, but we don't if they have want elections. To, we, we, we don't have the election. Elections. The election is supposed to be within the school. Right. We I'm saying it doesn't get done. It's a policy that gets ignored. It, huh? it happens. Can I? Actually, it does not. 
Can I ask? There's a school committee elected. I'm sorry, Steve was nodding. Through the student government, they elect the representatives to sit on the committee. Yeah, that's not what the policy is. The policy is that it's supposed to be school wide. It's the student advisory committee. There's a title for it. Can we send this to the policy subcommittee, please? Because I think if you look at the placement of the commas in two, you could actually look at it wildly different than what we've referenced thus far. So I would encourage us to send it back to the policy for, for number two in particular to look at the language and ensure that it's clear to come back to the full committee with language for two. So the other part of this policy that needs to be reviewed then is also number three because we as the full committee should be tasking the subcommittees with the, the things that they're supposed to be working on or topics, things like that, like similar to like the light situation we have now, that could have been something that instead of necessarily just keeping on Aaron, we could have tasked with the subcommittee, the finance and operations subcommittee to, to potentially assist Aaron with it. I'm using it as an example, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen, but there's different, there's different aspects that come up to our meeting that should be done that way versus there are so two agendas being put together that shouldn't have topics on them. I think the whole thing should go back. I, I, I'm just trying to understand, so as a policy subcommittee, we understand where the potential concerns are. So I've heard mm -hmm. two and three. Any other concerns throughout it? Well, yeah, I, think, I just don't think it matches how we've been doing it. So if they had a policy and they created this policy and then as far as we know, over eight years, never enforced this policy or did the policy. Should you know, is this where like you go where the path is, and that's where you put the concrete, or where you just put the roads where you want to put and make people? Well, it's not putting the road complain. where you want it to go. This has been the policy in the policy manual. But it's not been followed. It's been done differently. I understand, saying, but I guess I don't understand policy. how when it when it started to divert from what the policy was. But I'm asking, why is this? How is this better? And I've asked that, and I'll ask it a second time. How is the, what is here better than how we're doing it now? Well, the conversation is about subcommittees and their role and what their duties and responsibilities are. So, as a school committee and our subcommittees, we have not been following, and and the subcommittees have not been operating the way that they're they are set up to to do so. So. Remember that the subcommittees have no power independently. It's the full school committee. So the directive is given from the school committee. And the school committee is the body that votes on you know, things that we decide to move forward on. Has there been an instance where a, a subcommittee has decided policy or something like that? No, we're just making sure that everybody understands the role of subcommittees. But I think you just said a minute ago that there's been instances where the subcommittees were not that proper. Yeah. Can you, well properly. Can you expand on that? <clears throat> uh, I could. Well, one of, one of um, we were discussing meeting minutes earlier, so meeting minutes should be coming through the full committee. And I can say that since I've been on school committee, and I believe Sean also alluded to the fact that since he's been on school committee, he has not seen any subcommittee minutes come through the full school committee for approval. No, it's supposed to. For Just the, uh, the, um, the five-year plan um, minutes. Yeah. Meeting minutes. That's easy. So, but, right, but, you know, it's supposed to be done within a certain amount of time, but it hasn't been happening. So that's just an example of something that has not occurred that should be occurring. There have been other conversations that have happened at the subcommittee level that has not made it up to the full committee level. So it's just important to make sure that we make sure that we are. More conversations. So I, I'm being more than happy to speak on this because I'm the one that brought it up as a concern to the chair. Um, the fact that the finance operations subcommittee had a conversation about school choice and then actions were taken by the district that shouldn't have been taken by the district from the direction of the subcommittee when it wasn't the will of the full committee to take the actions. Um, and because that information hasn't been presented to um, the general public is why I'm being, I don't want to say vague, but. Are you talking about the survey? Yes. Okay. John, did I give you direct orders to create a survey? It, it's not a matter of there being direct orders or direct requests. It's committee? just making sure that. Or did, the, or did the committee discuss it and the administration felt that it was a reasonable survey to put out? We had talked about, it was part of the conversation about doing a survey, but nothing was decided. It wasn't decided in the meeting that we will do a survey and we will instruct the superintendent to do so. If that's not something we would do in the meeting. I understand, but it's when when information from the survey was shared with only subcommittee members when it should have been shared with members of the full committee. 
I'm just making sure that all of the items that are on the agenda or subcommittees are at the will of the full committee because that's what is supposed to happen. But the subcommittee did not direct the superintendent. I didn't say that they did. So I believe the superintendent did an excellent job of taking the initiative to try to gather information. Does he know the that? The superintendent sits in the meeting, so certainly if there is a question that pops up, and in this case it was, it was regarding um, school choice and more specifically why school choice students choose to attend this school, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a, a very important question. If the superintendent felt that it was important enough to create a survey for it, then I think rather than you know, rather than look negatively at the subcommittee, I would look positively at the subcommittee. Wait a minute, that's, that's been discussed, discussed at the full committee. Hang on, that's been discussed at the full committee, and we have instructed the superintendent on many occasions to dig dive deep into why people are. Yes, I'm not. But, but I can finish my thought. So. You know, rather than rather than looking at that conversation, looking at it as a, as a negative, like I would look at it as a positive because, you know, our CEO basically said, "Well, that's a great question. You know what? I I, I think that's good information. I think it's information we should have." So I, I don't see that as a negative. So that is, but you're 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 imposing an emotion on something that's not being said. There was nothing about what I said as it being a negative. I was simply providing you with an example. This, I'm not putting any negative onus on what the superintendent did or what happened in the meeting. It's merely in the meetings that I sit in, you make comments where you'll say, you, we should do this, we should do that, so that in turn becomes someone taking a directive, a direct action from a chair of a subcommittee. I'm not saying even saying that is wrong or negative or bad. I'm just saying I think it's important that it's very clear what the subcommittees are doing and working on so that the full committee knows, and we're meeting the requirements of the open meeting law. Motion to send policy B to E to subcommittee. It's already been made and seconded. It was, no, it was just you, to, you, to send it to the law saying, I don't know how to say right. motion to send policy B. Can you repeat that because I didn't hear you. Make an amendment to the motion to oh, send the whole. I want to hear his motion first. We started to talk. I, I'm amending Sean's motion to send policy B to E to policy subcommittee. So he's amending it to include all of the points rather than, I believe, I guess I said point two? Yes. Okay. So all of the points. That's our second part. I thought he was making a motion. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Things for a subcommittee. So just making sure that when you're reporting out, when you have a subcommittee meeting, making sure that items are reported out to the full committee as well. Uh, you, I don't, can you explain that? I don't, I don't quite understand. Just say it again. When a subcommittee holds a meeting, making sure that discussions that occur at that subcommittee meeting get reported out to the full committee. Yeah. Well, I think that would be the I think that would be the minutes. Bring the minutes to the meeting. I think that basically qualifies. Yes. I mean, but, but up until this point, it's we section doing ten that. subcommittee okay. updates. Isn't that where we're supposed to do it? If, if right. there's any meeting, we talk about what's been talked about. I think the minutes will make it'll all clear, that it'll clarify all So that. sometimes Not a problem. I don't think everyone always goes, okay, we can do policy B, E, policy A, B, C, D, E, F, G, so forth. Now you're covered. But I would encourage I would encourage us as members of the elected body to participate in the open meeting law training that's required of us every two years. Or at least, I, don't, I know I don't know that I don't know that anybody knows who hasn't had the law. Okay. You submitted to the uh, town clerk. Town clerk. Town clerk. <clears throat> I think I'm doing that next year. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Amazon, Amazon donation. donation. I'm going to recuse myself from this because I'm a uh, employee of Amazon, and though I did suggest and, and help facilitate this to a certain point, I think I'm just trying to step out of room. Yeah, step out of room. Okay. okay. So I guess the question on this is just whether the committee would authorize the district to enter into this agreement. This is a essentially an agreement proffered by Amazon of, to address the donations we receive on a periodic basis and that are put in the pantry at TWB. So in your packet you see it's a simple agreement with seven provisions. Um, we have in the past, or the committee has in the past voted to accept the donations. At that time, this um, agreement wasn't known to the district, but we have been asked by Amazon if we would uh, sign this as receivers of, of the gifts. So looking at it, I would not sign this based off of three, five, seven. <laughs> and the fact that the document is governed by Washington laws, well, Washington laws are uh, certainly friendly. They are not the friendliest state we would want to be in, so I would not sign this up. And more to do with three, five, and seven, it has to do with Washington plus. Do we know if we have the option of amending or redlining it to send it back somewhere? I know, well, I'm just... <laughs> you have the right to redline any agreement. <laughs> That you don't agree to it. Yeah, I would say that the committee has the right to propose any changes. It has the right to not sign. It has, I mean, it's certainly not compelled to sign this agreement <clears throat> just because it has accepted gifts in the past. But we're not accompanied by this agreement. Did we run this past council? We did not. Would there be any interest in at least having the attorney look at it and make proposed changes? I'm sure that if Patrick picked up two or three things on it. I'm sure the attorney will pick up five or six more. Um, question. And do we feel that the expense involved in having the attorney look at it and make proposed changes would benefit the district if Amazon did agree to the changes to this, uh, to this uh, contract? So it's my understanding that the boxes come in not marked, not labeled. We don't necessarily know what's in the boxes until we see them. That's correct. Do we know what the cost has been to dispose of anything that cannot be used? And has that been an added cost? I mean, I realize we have a trash service, but if there's items that have to be thrown away, I know that becomes an added. And I know that we have a, I think we have a policy for surplus. Um, this is more for a way, but that work, we get rid of it. So, can I just ask, like, so what's the, so you just said the boxes coming from Amazon, they're not marked, they're not labeled. So they come with stuff that may not be used by the district, so they end up having to throw away. We don't actually know what it is, or if it's appropriate for student, for the school to have. Again, I'm not knocking them. No, it just, I mean, if, if the boxes come in, I mean, are they, if the boxes don't have a label, they don't have a shipping label, they don't have anything. So we don't even know where these boxes are coming from. Uh, and that, so it was my understanding one box came with like 25 tennis balls and it was great for phys ed. Phys ed. Um, another box came in with giant containers of Tabasco sauce, not saying it again, it couldn't be used. But it's just an idea there was other things that couldn't be used at all in the school that I recall Al mentioning. I'm, uh, I'm, not sure say, I'm not sure I would say we don't know where they're coming from. We know they're coming from the, the Amazon Distribution Center. What we don't know is what's in them. It's not like, for example, the district says, we could really use yoga mats. You know, can you save those for us and send us a box and we have them. We get whatever we get. Some of the stuff we can use and goes in the pantry. Some of the stuff we can use and goes gets distributed to schools. There is some amount of stuff that we can't use and get thrown out. And I think uh, one of the problems at least last summer, I haven't been on top of it since then, was that there were so many boxes coming that it was filling 
classroom after classroom after classroom at um, the end of the day. And that takes people to just move it and, move, and sort. organize and sort. And that takes a lot of um, staff volunteering to do this because it's not in their job description. But I don't think that's what we're discussing here. Right? We're simply discussing the agreement right. and whether we feel comfortable signing the agreement or authorizing this we sign the agreement or not. Are we required to sign something? Not required to sign anything. Um, this was sent by Amazon with the request that we have someone sign it. We felt that it was important to bring it to the committee before just having a signatory. Do we even have a policy regarding? We do have a gifts you know, to the district policy. Does it cover, usually gifts to the district are, are monetary donations. Mm -hmm. um, or they could be like, like technology or instruments, things that you know what the district is getting before the donation is made. They can be both uh, monetary gifts or material gifts. The policy essentially says that gifts under amount, under a certain amount, the superintendent okay. can receive gifts of higher value have to go before the school committee, which is why these um, gifts in the past had come before the school committee because we were fairly certain that it exceeded the threshold. Thanks. I'm just looking at that because there is a public, a, a public gifts one, that policy. So I'm just, I'm just looking at my phone to get the policy so I can share it with you. So my recommendation, looking at this, we're just talking about the donation agreement, is not to sign it if Amazon pushes and determine that there's no value in what they're donating. Have a conversation with the attorney. But operate as we are until such time that Amazon refuses to shift it. Then to make a call would be my recommendation. So our policy KCB reads in accordance with state law, all grants and gifts to the district shall be reviewed and accepted by the school committee before expenditure or use. In the case of gifts from industry, business, or special interest groups, no extensive advertising or promotion may be involved in any donation to the school. Gifts will automatically become the property of the school district. Any gifts or cash, regardless of donor intent, will be accepted by the vote of the school committee, kept separate from the general fund, and expended at the discretion of the committee as provided by law. The committee directs the superintendent to assure that an appropriate expression of thanks is given to all donors. So just because you asked about the policy. Okay, is everyone okay? Moving forward as we have been, and if Amazon pushes back, then we can send the agreement over to the attorneys for review, if that's well, I would first ask if we think we're deriving enough value to send it to the attorney to Bill's point. And if, if what we're receiving we don't think is something that we should pay a legal bill for, get guidance on them. So, yeah, I've, I've never done an analysis of the value of the gifts received um, versus the cost of the staff in order to um, stop the pantry. I think that's really what would be the, the way to figure that out. Um, I can take a look at that and try to um, develop some suggestions or guidance of my own with respect to whether or not it makes sense to have invest any legal fees and trying to figure out whether or not this is worth it or something. Okay. So you have to have this. Mm -hmm. So at the December Sewell Road meeting, if you recall, we were talking about the U.S. News and World Report ratings and what it was that we valued in education, how best to measure that. And I suggested that looking at actual performance of our students in college would be a more direct way of assessing their preparation for post-secondary education than looking at AP participation and scores, which are predicted at best. Um, I said at the time, that I knew I could get the data for our district, um, but I was unsure whether I could get comparable districts. Well, um, the good news is that I was able to get our comparables, and so I have some information to share tonight. So, 
The next few slides follow the same format I used in presenting our accountability data. The boxes represent our peer districts, and I've shown the range of outcomes for the LVPC districts, although DESE does not identify any of the other LVPC districts as peers for us, based on differences between our communities. So the first thing you can look at is how many of our students enroll our college and university immediately following graduation. This is a percentage of our students who are sitting in a college classroom the September after graduating from high school. You'll see that just over three quarters of the class of 21 were enrolled in higher ed the fall of, of their graduation year, which places us in the close to the top of the range of other collaborative districts, but in the bottom half of the range for our peer districts. Um, the data is from the class of 21, which is the most recent available. That was obviously a year that was impacted by COVID. Um, but um, the reason we're looking at that as opposed to 22, which would be our most recent um, graduates, is that information is not available yet. So um, some of our students' subgroups enrolled at higher rates relative to their peers in similar districts, most notably multiracial students, and some of our students enrolled at rates that were lower relative to their peer groups, most notably Hispanic or Latino students. But most of our student subgroups enrolled at ranges to put them almost directly in the middle of their receptive peer group ranges. So um, that's the first measure. How many students who graduate end up in a college the next fall? But enrolling in college is just the first step to obtaining a degree. To reach that goal, you need to stay enrolled, and many students drop out, especially a large number of students drop out before the start of their second year. And so this slide shows students who continued from the first year to the second, um, and this is the class of 20, not the same group we were looking for because you have to go back a year to get the information about how many students persisted from year one to year two. Um, so here, I think our outcomes are decidedly better. More than 90% of our graduates who enrolled in college returned for a second year of college, which puts us above the median for our peer group and near the top of collaborative districts. Many of the student subgroups are well into the upper end of the range for their peer districts, including multiracial students who had a 100% first to second year persistence rate, which made us the exemplar among our peers. Our female students also came very close to best in group in terms of persistence. But the most direct measure of all, perhaps, is how many students actually obtain a degree. And which, that's what this slide shows. So we're looking at a different group of kids again because you need students who are in college long enough to obtain a degree. So this is the class of 2017. Again, it's the most recent group that's been in college long enough to earn degrees that have been reported to the database. Um, in this, these figures, Students who did not enroll in college immediately after graduation in 2017 are excluded from the data set. So this shows the success rate just of the students who enrolled immediately upon graduation. And you can see that um, about 70% of our students obtained a degree in the first four or five years. And that puts us in the top half of the range for our peer districts, as well as for our collaborative districts. Our black and as Hispanic or Latino students had the highest degree completion rates among our peer districts. They are the exemplars for our group, which is why they're in orange. Um, although our Asian graduates and students with disabilities showed lower rates of degree completion for their respective subgroups. So another way to look at this is to follow the class of 2017 through their college career. You can see that here at where they were at initial enrollment, persistence from year from the first to the second year in degree attainment and throughout that entire pathway our students were sort of in the middle range uh, of our peer group. And also look at that same class with respect to the LVPEC districts. You see that our students had the second highest success rate at, at each step in the process as compared to the other LVPEC districts. So another thing you could look at is whether 
Uh, student participation in post-secondary education is increasing or decreasing over time as measured by that first indicator, which is immediate post-graduation enrollment. And you'll see that we've been remarkably consistent, sending about 78 to 80% of graduating seniors onto higher ed, which has caused us to shift up slightly within our peer group, because um, some of the districts have seen changes of up to 10% in a negative direction. John, question on that. Sure. This is two or four years. That's correct. Any kind of post-secondary. Do we have a breakdown between two versus four? I don't have all the data. I can give you some data on two versus four, but not, not all of this. Um, and so then you can also look at it with respect to our other collaborative districts. Again, you can see for most of this time frame, we're number two. You can see, again, we're moving up within the, the group as um, other districts sort of have less participation in higher education, and our district remains relatively steady. Um, and so I did want to just also touch on other outcomes, because higher education isn't the only goal students have immediately upon graduation. Some want to join the labor force or the military. Um, in 2021, which is again the most recent year we have data for, about 10% of our seniors have aspirations along those lines. So here you can see how those different types of non-higher ed goals for our district compared to our peer district. And the bar that I think about most in the stack is the orange or the unknown component because I think it's important for everyone to leave high school with some kind of a plan. Um, even though everyone has to improvise and adjust to what life throws at them, it helps to know what you're improvising from. That's why I think about the orange part of the stack and keeping that as small as possible. Um, in 2021, that group that left with no real known plan was just 2% of our seniors, which is fairly small compared to our peer groups, as you can see. Um, However, you know, I'd love to get the percentage lower still because some of our, our peer districts were able to get below 2%. Um, so what I take away from all this is that while the percentage of our students enrolling in college immediately after graduation may be a few percent lower than it could be, our graduates tend to have more success remaining enrolled in completing programs, which causes them to wind up in a strong position if you measure success by our students' ability to complete what they set out to do. So that's what I can share about that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just uh, dovetail on, on Patrick's point. You can get us the, the data for the, the yep. before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just want to say, uh, um, excellent job. Excellent. That's it's incredibly helpful. Um, never seen data really presented this way in my for eight years. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's rewarding to see um, that the work that we do is making a difference. So thank you. I, I thank you for taking the initiative um, and doing this. Um, I think it's really valuable information, not just for us, but for the community as well. Thank you. Second. Can we make some of the data available to the Sure. Because I think it would be important, as you do some of this data dive, I think it's important that the community can see it as well. Absolutely. But thank you. Mm -hmm. So we will move on to public comment. Okay. I do have a comment that I was asked for you. Um, and this was from a student, Molly Wilson, who's a senior here at the top. Dear Hampton Wilbraham Regional School Di District School Committee, I was in attendance at the December school committee meeting, and as a student at Minichog, I would love the opportunity to share my opinions. In regards to school rank, I acknowledge that it can be important. However, the ranking system of US News and World Reports seems to value superficial statistics rather than the well-being of students. As an AP student, I have learned how valuable these classes can be as students gain both college credit and a deeper understanding of the subject. However, I have also learned that AP that an AP class is not always the right fit. At the beginning of high school, I value taking harder classes above all else. However, last year, 
due to scheduling issues, I was placed in honors American literature rather than AP Lane, and it was a potentially one of the best things that could have ever happened to me. I was introduced to my favorite book in that class and became a better writer. Additionally, I was, taken, I was taking a class that covered material I had cared about more than the content of AP Lane, a class I would have been taking simply for the sake of it being an AP class. By taking this class, I also was able to have a less stressful semester where I had the time to hang out with my family and friends on the weekends, a large difference from the semester prior when I was taking three AP credit classes. I also was able to devote more of my time to the difficult Spanish class I was taking and was more successful in that class because of this. This taught me, this taught me that forcing AP classes onto students is not the right solution. Not only will you be causing students to learn to prioritize the wrong things in their academic careers, but in some cases you will be setting them up to fail. If you really want to increase the amount of students taking AP classes, then subsidize the cost of AP tests in order to encourage financial equity within higher education. I urge you to prioritize students over status. Sincerely, Molly Olson. We will continue with the subcommittee updates. So we will begin with the curriculum subcommittee chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, finance and operations, Bill. Good, so we met on Monday, um, and then the meeting minutes all went direct around into the meeting minutes. So um, we had uh, a fairly robust discussion. Um, as you guys are probably well aware, uh, we are facing a $3 million shortfall. And um, looking at the uh, looking at the finance committee's sort of uh, poker faces on it, you can see that they're we're not nearly in the range where they're comfortable, and we're <coughs> we're at the point now where we're trying to whittle away at the budget. The problem is, is when you face a deficit this steep, there's no way that you can. There's no way we can whittle down the budget without impacting instruction somewhere along the way. It's just too big, it's just too big of a number. Um, so we will continue our work uh, with finance to try to get the number down as much as we can. And um, we did have a discussion at the beginning of the meeting about the about the round table. And there were some suggestions that were made, and I'll, I'll bring it back to you guys, where they were hoping that this particularly Mr. Ducey was, and uh, Carol Fitzgerald was hoping that the, the second round table would be a smaller sort of working group where, you know, I think this meeting was, was good. I think the budget round table was, uh, was sort of a, a, an excellent display for the, for the public and understanding where our money goes and where that deficit came from. Um, but there was more interest in creating sort of a, a working group um, for that second meeting kind of paring down the, the list a little bit. And rather than having a room full of 25 people try to get maybe like, you know, six or eight. Um, I'm just throwing that number out here. But that was something that was thrown out. I, and so I, I bring it back to you guys because I, I, you know, this is ever evolving, ever changing. You know, and I, I think what we want to do is we want to make the round tables as productive as possible, you know. And we don't want to get in, and Patrick had made a point, you know, the third year in a row, you know, talk to the, to the legislators about the exact same topics and what kinds of things can we do to make things better. I know that during the meeting, uh, Maura had a suggestion that we work with the MASC um, and possibly create a couple of resolutions for the MASC, um, which makes which makes sense. If the MASC is, the, is sort of our our you know our largest fulcrum that we have, uh, at least for in other districts. And, Creating uh, you know resolutions that can be discussed in the real world resolutions talking about special education certain grade reimbursement and how much that impacts the budget from year to year and you know so I think like, some good things came out of it. We still have work to go on the budget, but um, uh, I think overall it's it's you know it's it's going to be it's going to be a really hard budget year this year and it's going to be way worse next year. Once those federal grants dry up, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of space to back So I don't know, Sean or Mark, you guys have any other? Yeah, I'd like to add if, if you want to go first. You already talked to us, so go ahead. Okay. 
I had my hand up. Um, so basically, Carol brought up a really good point. She said that that meeting, the last budget roundtable, was more of a state of the schools meeting, and uh, having our representatives and stuff in there. I, you know, maybe that's something that we could do in the um, in the fall or, or early winter. You know, uh, and then the one that we would have now um, really is getting into the budget, like really deep diving. You know, answering questions and. Let, letting letting the, the, the town's people really understand where we're putting the money, why we're putting the money in certain places, and just that deep dive, I think that would just be helpful because the half, more than half of Wilburham's budget um, goes to, was it 61%, 62? And that uh, goes towards the school district. So, you know, really, 56, 57, 57? Oh, okay, okay. So Hamden's 50, uh, 61, and Wilburham's 57, something like that. We also had a discussion about maybe changing the dates for that, which is yeah. something where you would have a state of the schools sort of before, the, before like, let's say, the Thanksgiving break. So we'll have our Sims data back. And we can kind of get a, uh, you know, get an overview of just like we did, talk to legislators, and then do the working group in January, because I mean, our next meeting is March 2nd. Yeah. And we have to have our budget done and approved by March 24th. So that basically gives us, you know, just three weeks to have that working group get their work done. So if we did the working group in January to the state of the schools in the fall, that would definitely, I think that would help create a little bit more, um, give them a little bit more wiggle room as far as, you know, timing to, to get that done. I just wanted to touch base on the comment you made about the MASC involvement with resolutions. It was more specific along the lines of one of our biggest issues is the transportation. And for the last few years, Patrick has brought up a really great idea about considering having the legislature change the CPA use to include, you know, um, recreation to include sidewalks. And I think that we probably wouldn't be the only district that has that problem. Um, and so I think we could use our voice here as a committee um, to, you know, generate a resolution that we vote on and we send with Sean to the next um, meeting so that maybe other schools would buy into it. And then that's a great, to me, a great use of the legislator to say, you know, Jay Calvary said, you know, you gotta come knocking on our door. You know, you can't just expect us to say, hey, we're just giving you money. So let's do, let's try to use the MSC who has that, you know, voting body. And then the, um, the other use of it too would be to potentially see if there were other resolutions that we could help for the funding aspect of like the formula we've talked about changing, the, how they calculate the formula, and maybe starting that where we could get other school committees to go via MSC, as well as the possibility of leveraging the LPBDC and having a meeting where we all get together somehow. We don't know the, how it would work, but you know, if, if we have to speak as the, our portion of Western Mass to get funding, then how do we do that and how do we orchestrate bringing everyone together to say that we're all having the same financial difficulties I know that Aaron has mentioned a few times in our meetings about the lip service having the same concerns about increased costs. Um, that they, you know, how do you, how are they going to cover it? So, two, two things. So I, I was struck by the work that Aaron did comparing us to West Springfield and Jake's comment regarding chicken. School that you referenced to say, well, they needed that funding. Yesterday's Boston Globe, Boston Public Schools will increase their school budget this year, proposed by $65 million. They spent $28,800 per pupil, which is a 39% increase pre pandemic. So if you look, we can talk about sidewalks all day long, but it's, a, it's nickels and quarters. That's what we really need to attack. So we're hearing that these districts desperately need that money. And we look at 28 feet, and that's not a mistake, and that's roughly $12,000 more per student than we spent on a student here. And we're being told, sorry, we can't give you any money. If we're going to do a resolution, and there'd be some irony with me supporting a resolution, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, that's what it needs to focus on, that we're actually looking at something that truly can make a monumental difference in a budget. And that's ludicrous that we're being told these districts need that money more than us, and they're spending $12,000 more per student than we are. And that's just, that's 
actually is Boston. So that was the first part. Second part, uh, John, you said earlier, right? Every hundred thirty thousand dollars when you're looking at budget, we're looking at helps. I would ask the committee's thoughts, and I, I was thinking, Bill, about what you said with the strategic, or excuse me, not the strategic plan, but looking at really our our built environment. People in buildings, right? Those are the most expensive. We have a building right now that, to your point here, is under its planned operating capacity. We have another building that is significantly under its planned operating capacity that we, in theory, could ask the district to look at closing for next year, which would have an immediate budget relief and would also not put us in a position where we have a risk of it being dormant for more than five years, so it's not going to trigger the need for code updates if that strategic plan works its way through and it's decided that that building has a use for the district moving forward. It, we haven't handcuffed ourselves at all, right? We can still use that building. So I would really encourage us as a committee to ask the administration to look at what it would take to potentially close Thornton Burgess officially for next school year to potentially rehouse the program that is there now in another building that is under its planned operating capacity today. And that's potentially, I don't know if it's $130,000, I don't know what it is, but the message I heard from you is every single dollar helps, and I think we really need to take that into consideration. That can be done today while looking at the built environment for the future because that has to occur. We can't keep it, we can't have it to your point the other time. So, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about this for a couple of years. Um, and there's no question about it. I mean, if we look at our budget, there, unless you want to start really carving into education, the area in which we show the most amount of financial leakage is in our building utilization. There's no question about it. Last year, if you remember, um, our budget was reduced by the Finance Committee for $120,000 which was the direct result of the Finance Committee concluding that the operation of Thorn Burgess was costing the district $120,000. And so it basically reduced our overall budget by 120. And I can tell you, their eyes are fixated on this again, all right, and not just Thorn Burgess. They're looking at our building utilization, and I think it's fair for the taxpayers in these two communities to understand that we need to optimize what it is that we're doing. If we have the opportunity to close a building, then I think that it's something that we need to seriously consider. Obviously, education is the, is the main goal, but at the same time, I would counter to say that education is largely dependent on funding. If we have inadequate funding, then education will suffer. So we need to find a half medium between the two, and it's going to take it's going to take a lot of, sort of a lot of different discussions happening simultaneously. One of the things you have to look at is the regional agreement. You have to look at building utilization. We have to look at the new data that NESDAQ gave us, all right, looking out for our, our projections out until 20, 2032, okay? There's a lot of things that we need to consider in moving forward on this, but we have to, we have to do something. Um, the great irony is, is that the original five-year plan was set in 2000, 2017, which means that this would have been the year that if that five-year plan had gone through, that you would have had seven to, eight, seven to 12 in this building. Because five years later, we're facing the exact same problem. And now the only difference is, is five years ago, we were facing a budget deficit of around a million dollars an hour. So we're, we're hemorrhaging cash in terms of building utilization. I think it's crucial for us to really drill down on this. Uh, and we require a couple of ad hoc subcommittees looking at different parts of this in order to get it done efficiently. Um, strategic, plan, strategic planning committee is, is one group. There's only four members. There's only so much that they're going to be able to do. So I don't know if the committee wants to move forward on it, but I'm going to say that 
you know, it's a problem that we've known has been exist in existence for five years. So we really need to we really need to move on this. Is the committee okay with that? I have no issue with that. I would just say that if that's if that's the will of the committee, we should just make sure that both communities are communicated to publicly that that's what we're looking to do. Um, and just to make sure, because if, if that includes either giving the building back or the district maintaining the building, just making sure that's clear. Under our current lease agreement, we would maintain the building. But I understand. I just want to make sure that because if this is gets out, I just want to make sure that we're respectful and making sure that the select boards of both communities as well as the finance committees are aware of that. Can I just amend that motion to, um, to what's that, <laughs> the motion? Oh, okay. So I was thinking more, I was just thinking more along the lines of like, you know, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the three people who are probably the most instrumental in providing us the information. I don't know about educational programming. You all know about that, that's why you're here. So I would, Probably say rather than rather than sort of like you know buttonholing them and saying well, we're just going to look at the closure of one building. Can we sit down and look at like what we can do district wide, sort of removing the parameters of the regional agreement? Like what is what education? What is the best thing for our district? And what is the best way that we can move forward? Not only education but also financially. Actually, we we have a committee. Uh, that is that is supposed to be doing this. <laughs> I have a great subcommittee report. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. we'll tell you a lot of different we'll, things. We'll be talk talking, about. yeah, we, we have been talking about this, and I believe we are specifically meeting, what is it, Tuesday? Yeah. And we're specifically talking about school configuration. So I don't know, do you want to take the manager on it? Yeah, we'll finish this, but I yeah. So the reason I think that that is, I'm not sure the school reconfiguration could occur. In time the next year. And so as we're looking at the budget, and a budget that will have to be presented in what, two months, a month and a half, two months, that that is probably the one that you may be able to take action on and see an impact next budget. That was, I would agree with, I would agree with your assessment in that there is a committee that's doing that work, and I think that's critical work, but maybe there's more of a platform to look at one. Right. And, use it as a bridge. and that was one of the, the, I think one of the largest items that came out of um, the strategic plan planning committee, like when we were having the discussion to create the new strategic plan was at least looking at that, like everybody agreed that it was time to start to look at that to figure out the proper usage. I think if you're going to go back into changing the regional agreement though, you have to have a plan so people understand what that looks. It's better to have a visual than just people saying what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I agree with that. There's not enough time. Oh, yeah. There's no, but I think time. it's... There's not enough time to formulate a plan. There's certainly not enough time to educate the public about the, the, exactly. the utility and the, and the value of it. However, um, you know, I think I think that would be sort of a bridging step. Um, but I would, I would be cautious only in the standpoint that I don't want to necessarily, like, you want to make sure that you're constantly moving forward. I don't necessarily want to do all this work and move sideways. So. Um, you know, I would still encourage us to, to sort of, you know, brainstorm and figure out, like, you know, where TWB fits into the into the overall model of this, and you know, try to get a handle on education of like what we think the, the best is. I mean, I was looking at the numbers from Nasdaq, and if their projections, I, I was a little confused on some of their projections. It's actually going down and going back up, but those must be COVID babies. But yeah. then they were at, but they were adding numbers per grade. They're adding like 20 students per grade. Yeah. Um, a little different than the report that they had given us what, eight years ago, um, seven years ago. But at the same time, you know, if if we're using those numbers as, as a projection, you know, all of a sudden when you get out to 2032, you know, having six classes in this building now becomes tight. And then the decision becomes, okay, so do we try to reconfigure the students in the buildings or do we may consider adding an annex onto this building and allowing expansion in this building. So um, all things to be all things to be talked about, but I think that John and Aaron and Lisa really need to be like front and center on all of this because um, you
you guys have more knowledge about education than all of us put together. So I would really say that you know we need to look at the educational model, um, see the value in each, but also look at building utilization to figure out what it is that we want to do. I would say that the restrictions of the regional agreement, I would factor those. I would factor those in, but I would look first at what you think the most optimal educational uh, configuration would be based on not just finances, but certainly the, the well-being of the students, and also taking into account the projected sort of leveling and slight rise uh, in the district. Because even, you know, even going up, you know, they were putting us at like, I think it was 3069, which is not considerably higher, you're talking hundred more students. But you know, when you add those in uh, through uh, seven through twelve the half the students, if the students can make a difference. Yeah, my update's not as interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Patrick, sorry. Sorry. Oh. I, I just is that the will of the committee to ask? I don't think that that has been solidified. Yeah. I just wanted to all those in favor. I would probably say we're just. Working. I would say we're working on speaking on and yeah. present on Tuesday um, so what he's looking at the configuration of the buildings, and I understand that we could say next year is a skip, but I I would like to hear John's plan uh, and see what the other people for for Wilbraham and Hamden think about it. Could we hold it off for a meeting before we do it? Is it okay to wait two weeks? We're just talking about Thorn and Burgess, right? Yeah. Okay. Just moving the student, the programs that are there, so that that building gets. If it's feasible. Yes. Can we move it to last time we have this? We can work numbers to show what the program, how that was done. Okay. 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 So <laughs> my. <laughs> um, my LP back meeting was back in January, so things, and then we had the budget roundtable, so things might have changed when John gets to do his report, but this is my report. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, there's going to be a CTEC open house February 7th from 5 to 7 p.m., and they're highlighting advanced manufacturing technology, automotive technology, Carpentry, cosmetology, culinary arts, early education and care, building, property maintenance and management, graphics and visual design, health assisting, information support services and networking and landscaping. Um, at the time of the meeting, there were two finalists for the DEI coordinator, but I would assume there might be some changes since then. Um, there was an electric bus update Besides the 10 million grant that they had received, they just were awarded another 2 million grant for the, to add on to the buses. Um, each district will be getting at least one bus or more. So it does depend on routes and, and things of that nature and where um, charging stations will be. So they don't have that information yet. Um, and they started an advertising campaign to get more bus drivers. They did um, pr uh, started a print campaign in newspapers, a uh, radio campaign with local stations, and um, have some billboards up around the area. And that's it. On that CTEC open house, anybody that has an eighth grade child today received an email that the LPDC representatives and the HMERC representatives spoke to the eighth grade students made them aware of the open house and made them aware of the program. So just that point after. Just a point of order. Um, to, uh, would she need to submit the minutes from the uh, from the, from her meeting to this committee? No. I'm just wondering. They have meetings that are you have minutes. Some of these minutes for the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not a parcel committee. She's just our regular meeting. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Right. I just yeah. wanted to be clear. Thank you. You go back and get all the appropriation minutes and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I have nothing to report on the corporation, nothing to report on negotiations, um, more so policy subcommittee. So we met last night 
um, for a very brief, sorry, for a very brief meeting. Um, and what we, ha what you should have in your folder today, is the memo to review for the first reading two policies that just had some slight changes to them. Sorry, I had it open initially. Um, policy IJLA for library resources and policy JRD for student photographs. Um, there was just some language um, updates to IJLA for the library resources where um, wording was changed to be as reasons for withdrawing the item may include but are not limited to, um, as well as just adding the cross-reference of the instructional materials policy, IJ. Um, and then for the library resources policy, oh, sorry, for the student photographs policy, I apologize, I don't have that noted up here, but I know it was just some. You added the word before that. April mentioned. So it was just because there's wording changes, we have to run them by that committee. So tonight is just the first reading. The next meeting we have will be the second. Um, and then from tonight's meeting, I will take forward the BBE policy um, to be reviewed as well. We have been asked to take a look at the, by John uh, to take a look at the graduation requirements policy that we have. Um, and we had someone, we had a student appear at our meeting, um, but because they weren't on the agenda, couldn't speak, that there's been an ask to look at the attendance policy, um, pol the policy for attendance or dismissals. So you'll see that come forward in the future meeting. And then KCD, which was the, um, it was a, one of the corporate oh, gifts ones. It was some language change in September by the MASC. I haven't had a chance to fully review with the committee if that changes from the policy we have now, but just a couple of word updates um, from MASC. So you'll see those come forward as well. And that graduation change is to support vocational pursuits. So that's why we're looking at it. We didn't have the, we hadn't looked at it. So I didn't, it was briefly touched on just at the meeting for what the future agenda for our future ask for our future agenda. So our next meeting is February 13th at 4 o'clock p.m. in the district office. What was that for? Yes. It was 4.30. I know, but we, there was, because we were adding this meeting, we were changing the time. But it will be on the public doors. Just a quick one. So um, a, a student reached out to me um, who was over 18 years old. And uh, the issue was, what kind of rights does a student who is over 18 years old and therefore an adult in the eyes of law, um, you know, there were some issues. Um, and she wanted to, to speak to that. And I know Mara did talk to her. And I, I just, I just it, it was funny. I, I, I was surprised that we didn't have a policy when a student's 18 years old. You know, it's, uh, it's so good, good progress on, on business. So, like that. And, and even I did bring it up with John because you know our protocol normally that we didn't follow that. So our protocol is if a student comes to us, you know we encourage them to go to their guidance counselor, go to their principal, um, and then if the principal doesn't work for that, you know you can go to the superintendent, assistant superintendent. And I know talking with Shani said you've done that, so thank you for that. Um, I did bring after my conversation with the student, I did bring it up to John because I felt it was important to know that I had communication with the student, um, and he had said that that he had had conversation. Um, at the high school level for that because it obviously mm -hmm. it impacts a high school student. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if we have to have a policy on it so much as it's a procedural right. um, item for the high school. So um, we'll just get clarification on that for the next meeting and I did communicate to the student that we would reach back out. Oh, great. So it might not even have to be a policy change. This might be something. That they do at the school level. Oh, great. Thank you, Mark. No problem. Thank you. All right, so the planning committee update. Um, so we met on January 24th. Um, the role of the planning committee is to look at long-term issues facing the district. The group is asked to look at the following items and make recommendations to build bridges to the representative bodies and communities that we represent. Um, this may include coming up with better ways of doing things or confirming that we've optimized the way that we do things. 
So our priorities are building utilization, and this includes looking at quantitative data, um, surrounding enrollment, building capacity, space constraints, flexible reconfiguration, which would also include building tours. And things may get added as we look at some of this information, but those are the things that we're focusing on right now. And that is going to be our primary focus at our next meeting. Um, we will also be looking at the regional agreement and assessments. So that, that would include the potential to cross town lines, and this would also include surveying community members and eventually create a schedule for an annual review of the, of the regional agreement. Um, we also discuss community relations, uh, identify ways to bring the towns together and communicate into the broader, the broader, more broad community. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so that's non-school community members. Um, so this. For example, this would be utilization of print media using the hands of Wolverham Times, the reminder um, for important announcements, um, the town-wide robocalls, and then um, utilizing the local news media, and then the superintendent has offered to have a superintendent's corner and the local newspaper, <laughs> which he's very excited about. <laughs> um, um, the planning committee is able to make interim um, recommendations throughout this process, and we will work we will work to be as thorough and efficient as possible um, and not take the whole five years that the strategic plan allows for. Our next meeting is Tuesday, February 7th at 6.30 in the district's conference room. And I thought that was the, the, the reiterate, you know, the head on level, um, that, that if, if we agree with something, then we bring it back to the committee right away rather than, you know, not just one big report, like, so, there'll be a lot more, hopefully, back and forth once it, it comes to an agreement, you know, once we've reached out to the townspeople and, and get a, get a, as much of a consensus as we can generate uh, for voting uh, here. I, I would say that I know you have representatives for select board uh, from each town. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry. I know you have representatives from select board on both towns, um, probably created quite a lot of information for uh, finance and advisory for both towns as well uh, to make sure that they're in the loop on what's going on. And obviously we would be using our facilities people to provide to a lot of this important information. Yes, <coughs> but for, for right now, yes, we will be getting all those members and bringing people in as needed. But right now the committee is the four members. They don't want to fill out a loop. No, this is right. something that we, one of, the, one of the things was making sure that we're very transparent um, with our communication, making sure that everybody's aware, which is making sure that we, we not only are communicating at our subcommittee level, but also with the school committee, but also the, the broad community um, and all parties involved in making sure that, you know, the people that have the information that we need, you know, with the buildings, um, that we get everything that we need and have the conversations and the input that's necessary. Did you mention the location? Um, I said nothing. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Motion approved. Jared, that's Jared. I keep Second. I have just one. Um, the January fifth. Just um, Actually, so. Are you doing the consent agenda or are you doing the report? Well, because there's a vote on C and a vote on B, I just do the minutes. Oh, okay. Um, just on the note of the, under the executive session, there was, um, it says, for Chairman Blue the current secretary is not present during the executive session. I do not believe they stated that during the meeting. So we just have to make sure that if it wasn't stated at the meeting, then it's not added in. Thank you. Okay. Oh, so I would move to approve um, with that change. That was just part of the consent agenda. Okay, so this is this is a field trip that's happened in the past. So just to well, show proof to come field trip to hiatus. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay. Motion carried. 
Motion to approve donation to Green Meadows Drama Club in honor of John M. Flynn. Second. I have a question on that because the, what was in our folder had a non-disclosed amount. I was curious on that as well. So I wasn't sure how we can approve something if we don't have an amount of what it is. If it's over five hundred dollars, I think that is that's the threshold. So for it's. Do you know that it's over five hundred dollars? If it comes to us, it has to be over five hundred dollars. Okay. And, and they're getting nods from Aaron and from John. I was just curious. Why is it not disclosed? The donor wanted to keep it private. Okay. And they didn't make a sign of agreement. No agreement. <laughs> we have to it for you. <laughs> With we'll removal in Delaware. All in favor? Aye. 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 Let me begin by lowering expectations and maybe saying we have to go to the tape because um, if anyone's interested, I'm not planning on bringing a master plan next Tuesday. Um, I have started to gather some information about the uh, listed occupancies of schools and what they can actually hold in a practical matter because um, the listed occupancy is basically based on if you had the building maxed out. If you had the building full of um, students and had an assembly going on and had members of the public. So it's meant for like all hands on deck, but your actual educational spaces are a subset of that. So um, what I will be doing on Tuesday is providing some information about what our listed capacities for all the schools are and for um, one of the schools where I've been able to actually go around and go through each of the rooms and get some realistic numbers. And I'll be doing that with all of them. Sorry, it's not going faster, um, but Member Ryan and I are on our third meeting this week. So, <laughs> there's, so there's a lot, um, and there's a lot of other stuff which you will see too as I give my report. Excuse me, John, with, with that being said, do we want to make that motion to close TWB, uh, to instruct them to close TWB next year, or are we happy with how it was? No, it wasn't a motion, it was just to look into it. Oh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, can you do Thank you, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, Next, I'll, I'll thank Green Meadows for sharing the invaluable insights from the recent family reunification bill. I spoke about that a lot at my last report. Um, their work and preparation paid off just days later when we had to actually implement a family reunification operation after the WMS evacuation. Uh, but their support went beyond sharing insights. For those of you who don't know, they also sent some of the staff who had helped set up their drill to help with the family reunification that took place here at the high school. Um, so I just wanted to thank them and let them know how appreciative of the teamwork I was on that. Um, also, with respect to my entry plan, I want to let you know that that is wrapping up. I'm looking forward to presenting my entry findings at the next school committee meeting. So I'll be able to share some reflections on what the first months have been like. Uh, the website review and evaluation team continues its work to improve our district website. The team had a meeting with a local firm named Wild Apples two weeks ago. We also have a meeting scheduled with another local firm, Redeker, to review their website solution. We hope to make a final determination concerning the product and process that best meets our needs for communication in the future so that we can prepare for a migration to whatever comes next in the next fiscal year. And then following up on a report you heard earlier, happy to announce that the search for a new DEID coordinator has come to a close. And I'm thrilled to announce that Benetta Lightfoot, who has served since 2016 as the Multicultural Affairs Operations Manager for STCC has accepted the position. Appreciate working with the other LDPEC superintendents and executive director Joyle to make this selection. And I look forward to working with Vanetta to improve our district. In other personal matters, I can also report that the district has hired Dr. Carolina Kapsinski as a middle school Spanish teacher for Green Meadows. The absence of Spanish instruction at Green Meadows was brought to my attention even before I was hired. So I'm happy that we're finally able to provide the students of Hampton with this learning opportunity. Two meetings with Mass, Mass Insight are set to kick off the audit process. These meetings will take place tomorrow and Monday. The focus of these meetings will be to forge a partnership between Mass Insight and staff from w, HWRSD to align on the equity audit timeline and outcomes 
familiarize ourselves with the Mass Insight District Equity Audit Framework and review the stakeholder engagement process, establish career communication channels, and ensure thorough data collection for a complete picture of the district. And knowing that vocational opportunities and expanding them is an important goal in the strategic plan and an important goal for many of our community members, we've been examining our practices specifically around educating and informing families about the vocational and technical educational opportunities available through CTEC. As you heard earlier tonight, um, we are doing a very consistent and thoughtful outreach to eighth grade parents, which is a change of practice um, from the past. Um, to that end, inviting CTEC staff to meet with current eighth graders and their families, and we'll be asking the committee to approve some minor adjustments to our graduation requirements. As you may recall from the December meeting, um, Principal Hale was talking about the disadvantage our students are at by not being allowed to go to CTEC as ninth graders. Um, part of that is based on graduation requirements, but working with high school staff, we feel that there's a way to modify that so that we could send students in ninth grade. I think it would dramatically expand vocational opportunities for our students, and I think it um, would still enable them to be held to a very rigorous standard. Um, next, um, the middle school has restructured the learning time deficiencies that I reported on, both at middle school and Green Meadows. Working together with school staff, um, administrators were able to find a solution that satisfies them and satisfies the law. Um, essentially, it's about reducing passing times and increasing time on learning. So I'd like to thank everyone for their ideas and the flexibility they brought into their search for a solution. Finally, I've included in your packet enrollment for February, which stands at 2,880, as well as NESDEC enrollment projections for the next 10 years. Projections, of course, are not an exact science, but they do give us a sense of what might be likely, which is a modest decrease in high school enrollment and a modest increase in student enrollment in grades K to 8. And that is my report. Jack, can I just ask one question? Sure. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, the, so I'm, my middle child is, uh, Angela is in eighth grade. So I was actually home that day when the call went out. Um, and so when we look at the, when we look at the, the um, how things were set up, and I know John was facing, you know, but just, you know, just a, a very unsettling situation and, and trying to move those kids. Um, with respect to each one of the schools, um, I would say that evacuation plans um, we're going to need to look at <clears throat> how exactly the evacuation plan is going to work um, at the practical level. Um, Stony Hill was basically backed up in both directions. And I think about that not only in terms of, you know, people waiting in their cars, but also, you know, through traffic, people trying to get through, emergency vehicles, etc. So I would, I would really implore um, the administration to work with each of the schools to look at their unique situation. Um, the high school is in, is in a much different position. There's, there's different areas of ingress and egress. Whereas when I look at Stony Hill or I look at Wilbraham Middle School, there is one access road going in, which really limits the ability to have student, to have uh, cars come in and out. Um, so. You know, I know that I was in traffic for probably 45 minutes, and other people were in traffic longer than I was. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think it's crucial. I mean, this is a water main break. What if it was an active shooter situation? Um, the, the tensions and the emotions run much higher. Um, so I would want to make sure that we have as an efficient process as possible to move the students to a safe location and then allow uh, unification to. Uh, to occur there. Um, like I said, I mean, I, I didn't even see that. The, I had a, a, a friend who was farther up in the line than I was, and I know that the, the, the uh, Wolverhampton police weren't there until about 30 minutes after the call went out. And by then, the traffic had backed up in both directions. You know, pretty much Stony Hill was down to, to Glen Road, and I don't know how far it was going, you know, going south, but, um, you know, I would implore us to take a, a hard look at that. Uh, to make sure that going forward that we have a, a usable plan uh, because it was a, it was a long wait. 
that um, we thought about after after this particular event was would it have been better to relocate to the high school and then do the um, family reunification there, and which, which was actually, you know, one of the things that went out to families in my message that night was if we have a future situation where we're able to do that, we may want to move the traffic to a different spot. So certainly as part of our thinking about what it might be like next time, but I'll, I'll also say just a couple things. Um, one is that anytime we have to do family reunification, it's going to be a long process. It's not like dismissing from the school at the end of a regular day. It's, it takes hours and You have to make sure that every child goes. Right. Yeah, it's, so it's, that's perfect. yeah, it's perfectly understandable. Um, and I, I do agree with the idea that, you know, I think if, if, if evacuation of the building is of urgency, then we should really be looking at evacuating students from the premises and then do the reunification somewhere else. Because like I said, this is a water main break. But if it turned out to be a fire where there was potentially dangerous situations, now you have kids standing outside. So I truly believe that the, the, that the evacuation plan should be get the kids out of the building, have them accounted for moving to a safe space, and then allow reunification to occur there. That way you're covering all the bases. So if it's just a water leak, it's just a water leak. But if it's a fire, an active shooter situation, then the, the same, if it's the same plan, it's the same plan. You don't have to worry about altering it. Well, I'll, I'll say that it may not be, you may not be able to do that. Every situation is unique. There may be some situations where we're not able to um, move students from the school. Um, it may be that the threat is in the community, or it may be that for other reasons, reunification can only be done on site. So. That is a possibility as well. But thinking through this one, you know, if we're in a situation where we can safely move students to another building first, um, I think that might be a better way to go in the future. It was, it was, it was a good training exercise. You know? and the only way you're going to know it is to actually have it happen. Right. So that water break was wild when I saw the video of that. Uh, one thing, um, having tried to uh, get some things done, Traffic-wise at Stony Hill, uh, Stony Hill Road is a uh, state highway, and so nothing can be changed without state approval, and it's a long process. Sorry. <laughs> the enrollment report. Are those numbers right for Green Meadows? I mean, if we've, we've talked about declining enrollment at Green Meadows. If they can look at that's like a three percent increase just in January. They picked up nine students, and it's across the board. It's three grades that didn't pick up any. So it's not like that's a pre-K increase that we sometimes see. So all I can say is I I don't actually go check with principals to make sure that the numbers are right. I believe the numbers are right. I have heard principals talking about move-ins throughout the course of the year. So well, that's what's curious. I mean, that, yeah. that's awesome, right? So when we talk about it, how long have we had the conversation of declining enrollment, specifically in Hammond, declining enrollment? And that, that's, a, that's a big jump. And then if we look at it, just compare it back to 2020, let's say, and of the K through 5, every grade but one, has an increase from 2020. And if we look just to write 2020 as a compare, we're four students short of where we were in 2019 and 2020. With a, and, and it's all, and if you were to look at it, you could say it's all in pre-K. And then six, seven, eight, potentially. So six, right, you look at that difference, it was 19, in grade six, it's four now. So that tells you that the K through five, we're seeing the we're seeing the jump. That's this is a good thing. As many times as we've sat there, said, what can we do? It, it's naturally occurring. And there's a lot less 
for sale signs, as soon as they go up, I will tell you they quickly are down. Or homes that are built for sale for keep between Wolverham and Hamden right now. That's really nice to see. So, um, teacher agenda items. We have booster club once we value Dr. Health Service update, Grant Writer, and the Bell School Program of Studies, also the High School Program of Studies, we have a call for the Cap Connect meeting, um, the LPBC Collaborative, and parameters of stabilization fund, METCO update, on table number two. Um, also discussing, um, I guess, uh, possibly uh, numbers reflecting the closure of TWD. Oh, and then, yeah, okay. anything else? Anything else to add? I, I, maybe this is a, a, a quick answer, but do you remember that round table? Um, the, 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 what was it? Uh, Angela people said that, uh, that the booster club had secured like $350,000. Um, to pay off the, the rest of the turf. I thought, wasn't the turf supposed to be funded by? I don't think it was to pay off the rest of it. It was paid it towards. Oh, or towards. Yeah, yeah, towards, towards that. Um, I thought that was the, 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 the thing that was the selling point before that we raised. Is it, have they done any fundraisers or something? Can we, I don't know, help them with that? Like promote whatever fundraising kind of that they're doing, or at least let them come and speak to it? That's why it's on there. Oh, OK, good. Yep. good. All right, yep. cool. Hey. I've got a little a meeting for the subcommittee. Subcommittee. Anyway, that meeting will um, look at um, Steve Hale will be there to look at the um, moment for, um, what is it? For the uh, program studies. Right? Yeah, the enrollment for program studies. Um, so there's going to be a change in it. Um, so um, I just wanted everyone to know that uh, that was coming up. Um, so we will be presenting that. Um, and that's for our next meeting. The acoustics are a considerable challenge at Mile Street in past meetings. Can we work to make sure that we can do whatever in advance to make sure that we can hear each other? Is that the one where yeah, the sex Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's yes. Like boys versus yes. girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a dance. It's a dance. You name it, it's everything. <laughs> so the layout and configuration yeah. plays a big role. The uh, sharks versus the jets. Yeah. Like, oh, as we said the last time, that one did Waiting for somebody to ask you to dance at the yeah. school dance. <laughs> but then you could also, in theory, do it in the library. I mean, the library is uh, what we used to do PTO meetings. We, we had more people that would come to a, a school community meeting in the library there. So maybe just an idea. Judging by the amount of um, audience we have at the meetings lately, I mean, we could, you know, downscale a little bit, plan to have a couple of extra seats depending on who's coming to visit. With that, our next meeting is Thursday, February 16th at 6.30 um, at Mile Tree School. We are invited at 6 o'clock for a Mile Tree presentation. We'll show adjourn. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Bill? Aye. Cheryl? Aye. Tom? Aye. 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 Uh, myself, I eat with three urgent. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Enjoy. Please check. Uh, uh, yeah.